Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are. My name is Eric Sussman. I'm managing partner of Sequoia Real Estate Partners and senior lecturer at UCLA's Anderson Graduate School of Management. It's my pleasure to speak to you today about opportunities in the multi-family real estate market and why we think today is the opportune time to capitalize on those opportunities. Broadly speaking, real estate plays a crucial role in any well-balanced or diversified portfolio, offering opportunities to balance between things like risk and return, current cash flows and growth, and offers a hedge against potential future inflation. Certainly offers compelling risk-return trade-offs, again, whether you're looking for current cash flow or potential growth. And depending what your views are on inflation, if the most recent Federal Reserve's largesse ultimately results in inflation, real estate should provide an effective hedge. We're especially bullish on multifamily real estate opportunities, as we will discuss in great detail. We think they're extremely well positioned both now and looking forward. While other classes of commercial real estate, retail, industrial, and office face remaining headwinds uh, in the uh, today's economic environment. Real estate is favorably correlated with other asset classes, and what this slide depicts is sort of how real estate moves in connection with other asset classes. As you can appreciate, when economies are moving in one direction, you want to have a diversified portfolio to hedge against certain events. For example, if you look back at the economic crisis, obviously gold did it very, very well. If you look at the slide, what you'll see is real estate is a nice hedge or favorably correlated to other asset classes. And that's something, you, again, you want, any investor wants, in a well-designed, diversified portfolio. Real estate does not have to be a marriage. And what we mean by that is many investors are afraid that if they invest in a private equity real estate fund, that they'll be stuck for an extended period of time. The reality is Sequoia Real Estate Investment Partners funds have lives of between five and seven years, which we feel is a middle ground. It allows us to take advantage of opportunistic short-term opportunities, and it doesn't tie people up, uh, up indefinitely. If you want pure liquidity, of course, you can look towards more passive real estate vehicles like uh, real estate investment trusts or mutual funds. But we feel, for reasons we'll describe later, that private equity real estate funds offer real great flexibility and niche opportunities and should be part of a diversified portfolio. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we feel that multifamily uh, real estate apartments are especially attractive for any number of reasons, and we're going to go into some depth on this because we think it's a very important uh, topic to address. First is the availability of financing. If you look at other commercial real estate, again, retail, industrial, and office properties, financing is very tough. You're talking about a local bank, perhaps a private fund, or friends or family. Multifamily investments have a great debt partner, and that is Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Both actually have been huge sources of debt financing and liquidity to the real estate market. It's plentiful. It's available. The underwriting is, is reasonable, uh, arguably uh, aggressive in terms of rates and other terms that are available. And this certainly contrasts to the financing for single-family homes, where underwriting is still a real challenge and debt is not so available. You may have heard that Fannie Mae is unloading large bulks of, uh, of, of homes, but as of today, they are not providing any sort of financing in connection with those acquisitions. Again, such is not the case with multi-family real estate assets. The loss in single-family home market is sort of been transferred to multifamily. I can't say it's a zero-sum game that the exact loss has been a windfall for multifamily, but certainly to some degree that is the case. For one thing, foreclosures have turned owners into renters. Uh, that trend is certainly likely to continue at least for the short run. 
longer term, as we'll discuss, there are broader uh, tailwinds which are forcing uh, the rental market to really expand. One of those things is household formation. I'll give you some data on this in a little bit, but household formation has declined substantially, mostly as a result of the economic crisis and continuing relatively high uh, unemployment rates. And as we'll discuss, this pent-up demand from declining household formation will eventually manifest itself in greater demand for multifamily uh, apartment units and higher rents. High transportation costs, again, we'll talk about this in some more detail, but I think it's common sense to understand that higher fuel prices means that people do not want to commute long distances and are more eager and willing to live closer to jobs in higher density urban environments. Again, translation, greater demand for rental housing in the urban core. Recent headlines speak to the trend. The LA Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post have all run uh, articles and headlines speaking to this trend, that rents are going up all the while single-family home prices decline or stagnate at best. In fact, in 20 different markets, it is cheaper now to buy than to rent. Now, that is uh, a question that all of us must have, whether that is a, uh, uh, a cyclic trend or something that's more structural in nature. And we think it speaks to something structural in nature, a longer-term trend towards renting versus ownership. Again, we'll speak more about this in upcoming slides. This slide speaks about financing. As I mentioned earlier, there is no question that the availability of financing to the multifamily market has been a real boon to that market. If you look at the rates, they're extremely low. The 10-year U.S. Treasury bond is now below 1.9%. In fact, as of this morning, I checked, it's below 1.8%. That does manifest itself in lower multifamily rates. Mortgage rates are at all-time lows and yet still are not providing enough lift to the single-family market because of other issues on the demand side of the equation. But certainly these low rates have been terrific for uh, multifamily housing. One question I think all of us need to ask is, do we see that trend reversing? Because to the extent there is higher inflation, this will reverse itself. I do not believe that high inflation is in the nearer term picture whatsoever. In fact, Ben Bernanke, chairman of the Federal Reserve, has said as much that it is their intent to keep interest rates low through 2014. The reality is, with unemployment as high as it is, with as much slack as there is in the economy, and with real wages declining or staying stagnant, inflationary pressures are very, very modest. The other side is if rates were even to increase and we were to have some inflation, we think in multifamily apartments uh, or units, rents will increase in such an environment because of the shorter term nature of leases and the ability to raise rents more rapidly, and that would serve as a tremendous buffer to increases in interest rates. This picture tells a thousand words, as graphs often do, about sort of this trend between home ownership and uh, rental market. And as you can see, the home ownership rate has reached a near-term near low and continues to drop. I think that trend is likely to continue, albeit modestly. Meanwhile, the renter households continues to increase. Again, the question all of us need to have and ask is whether this is a short-term cyclic trend or something more structural in nature. We believe it is the latter, a longer-term structural change. And we'll, again, we'll speak more about that. This shows the issue from another perspective, apartment absorption versus home ownership. Apartment absorption, or absorption generally as a real estate metric, measures in any given period how much square footage was rented as opposed to new supply coming on the market. To the extent there's positive absorption, that means more units or square footage was rented versus what came on the market in terms of new supply. Absorption in apartments has been uh, growing and positive. Again, units are getting absorbed. Meanwhile, home ownership declining, consistent with what we saw 
in the earlier slide. We mentioned declining household formation, and again, this picture speaks volumes. Starting in 2008, which the economic crisis, the formation of households declined substantially. People don't have as many children. There's doubling up of renters. There's children moving back home with their parents because of their inability to find employment. That trend will ultimately reverse itself. It's not sustainable. It's not equilibrium. What's likely to happen is the economy does improve, and it has improved. As employment picture improves, and it has improved, albeit not as significantly as probably anyone, uh, any of us would like, this will result in greater demand for renters. That is sort of the first place people go when they look for housing. As my, one of my business partners said, you can't outsource housing. Uh, eventually, people will rent as they sort of leave their parents' nests or move out on their own from the doubling and tripling up we saw during 2008. Fuel prices. I don't think I need to say much about this. I think everyone on this, uh, on this call or listening to this, this podcast understands that fuel prices have increased dramatically. They've come down a little bit in recent weeks, but by and large are very high. And again, what this means ultimately is people are not going to want to drive as much as they used to. They're going to want to live nearer to their jobs, nearer in the urban core. And that means, as we said, higher density, higher demand for rental housing, as opposed to the single-family detached home with three bedrooms and 3,500 square feet. That is what's likely to happen. Sort of a reversal of the post-World War II trend of suburbanization in the United States. The United States evolved quite differently than most countries around the world, where the urban core of the United States was generally where our lower income demographic lived, while the uh, more wealthy demographic moved to the suburbs. That is a likely trend that will reverse itself. This is a sobering slide. I always have mixed emotions about showing it partly because I live at least part of my life in the academic world, and of course many of my students are suffering from what this slide suggests, and that is the increasing cost of education and the increasing student loan balances that our graduates are carrying. What happens whether you're pursuing an undergraduate degree or a graduate degree and taking on student loans is that student loan balance will certainly impede, act as an impediment towards our graduates buying homes. It may be delay, but it's delay nevertheless, and that is not a positive for acquisition of single-family homes. And there's no reversal of this trend. I don't think you'll find too many people who believe that the cost of education is going to be declining substantially anytime soon. It's just not going to happen. So as the cost of education continues to increase, as student loan balances continue to increase, that serves as certain headwind towards the single-family home uh, market and acquisition. The positive spin for Sequoia Real Estate Partners and others is the rental market. Those folks are going to rent, maybe not permanently, but certainly for an extended period of time, which again bodes well for that market. It's, again, sort of that zero-sum game. Single-family homes losses are apartments gains to some degree. We believe this is not a cyclic, a short-term, uh, cyclical sort of short-term change, but a longer-term structural change in the marketplace. The reality is I think most of us would believe that unemployment levels are going to remain stubbornly high. Income levels are going to lag. The second point here is critically important about labor mobility. I read recently in a study that the average college graduate is going to have something like 10 different jobs by the time they retire. Highest levels ever. Again, harking back to World War II and sort of the development of the middle class in this country after World War II, where it was quite common to have a single job or two jobs and retire at a particular company receiving a pension. Those days are long gone in my view, and I think economists and uh, those specializing in the field would agree with that. Labor has to be mobile. If you're going to have 10 different jobs, 
in different cities potentially, owning a home with its illiquidity, with its high transaction costs, may not be the right alternative. Renting is likely to be a better uh, and more efficient alternative for our current graduates who are going to have to be mobile. In some cases, globally mobile. And the last bullet point talks about what we mentioned earlier, the increasing trend towards urbanization. Part of that is, again, the high fuel costs, uh, issues of infrastructure in terms of our highways and byways. Traffic is horrible, certainly here in Southern California, but in many cities in the United States. I think part of this trend is also just a change in the social fabric. I think the new generation of, let's say, college graduates, they want to be wired in. They want to be wired in in terms of where they live, where they work, where they play. They want to be part of that network. So I think for that generation, being close and living in high density housing is very comfortable for them. I think they're more eager to rent and live in higher density than to own the 3,500 square foot suburban house. And I believe that is a generational change of today's younger uh, demographic. The data supports what I'm talking about, and I could provide even more data to support the thesis. If you look at apartment and vacancy trends, post the financial crisis in 2008, the blue bar in terms of uh, rents, they've been increasing and increasing quite dramatically, while vacancy has declined. You might think those would move in opposite directions, and they are, but I mean, uh, it's clear that while rents are going up, people are even renting more units, which is sort of maybe counterintuitive. This graph speaks volumes and supports the thesis. Many forecasters agree Oftentimes they don't, but in this case, many do, and it's not surprising. Uh, the demographics, the supply and demand factors speak loudly and clearly about the positive attributes of the multifamily marketplace. So how can investors take advantage of the opportunity? And we'll talk about how important it is to time this sooner rather than later. We believe private equity real estate funds are a great place to play. Uh, they offer uh, niche opportunities uh, to focus on a particular market segment like multifamily. That's all uh, Sequoia uh, Real Estate Partners does is rental housing. And that's all we will do. It's what we know and what we believe to be the best opportunity. We're a middle-sized firm. We're not competing with large Wall Street firms that want to acquire Class A assets very high profile assets are not likely going to overpay in the process. On the other hand, we're not trying to compete with the mom and pops who are striving to buy smaller units and also are likely to overpay. We play in sort of what I would call the middle ground, uh, 50 to 200 units, oftentimes secondary or tertiary markets close to jobs, that's crucial. We are very focused and able. We manage all of our assets uh, at least those that are geographically uh, close to where we are situated. And it's, a, again, a focused niche strategy we think is crucially important. This is one of my favorite slides about where opportunities are. There are two broad niches in terms of uh, multifamily or any real estate assets, and that's Class A, what you might think of as turnkey assets. They're in perfect shape, deferred maintenance is a minimum, they're well managed and well positioned. Class B, Class E, what I like to think of as workforce housing, blue collar housing. Uh, we believe that the latter, Class B and Class E, offers much better opportunities for a bunch of different reasons. One is the opportunity to improve the asset, to increase rents, to increase cash flows. If you step back and think about acquiring uh, the Taj Mahal of, of apartments, a beautiful Class A asset in a really great market, what are you going to do to add value? At that point, nothing. What can you do? Yes, to the extent rents go up, you'll, you'll enjoy that rent increase, but certainly cap rates, the values on which real estate asset prices are based, uh, are not moving. It's much more, in my view, of a gamble. You may think it's low risk. To me, it's actually higher risk. Class B and Class E assets offer you potential for upside, a buffer if nothing else. The ability to add rents by better management, by capturing what we call the loss to lease, 
the difference between market rents and the rents being achieved by the property, the ability potentially to amenitize the asset. You're not going to convert a Class C asset into a Class A asset. That's virtually impossible without tearing it down. But you can convert a Class C asset to a Class B asset. You can convert a Class B asset to a Class B plus or an A minus asset potentially. And in doing so, not only increase cash flows, but give yourself the opportunity to exit the opportunity to a broader array of buyers. The other thing is if you look at the spread, the two graphs, you'll notice the one on the right has a larger spread. The difference between a cap rate and the 10-year uh, U.S. Treasury rate. And that also serves as a buffer. It sort of speaks to what I was talking about. That if you buy a Class B or C asset, you've got a little spread to play with. Class A, a much narrower spread. Those assets are in great demand by the institutions. Those players we don't want to compete with. Timing. Timing is everything in life, and real estate investment is no exception. The next two slides speak directly to that point. People, investors, follow the herd mentality. They invest where it's hot, whether it's uh, social media, initial public offerings, or single-family residential housing in 2006 and 7, exactly when they shouldn't be doing it, or the dot-com bubble, etc. If you look at when private equity real estate capital was raised in this last cycle, this graph speaks volumes. When did it hit its very peak? In 2008, the top of the market. When was it lowest? Well, right after the 2001 recession, which was not nearly as painful a recession as the 2008 recession was. But people didn't come pouring in until it was too late which is very clear by this next slide. Which private equity real estate funds did the best? Well, obviously, the vintage 02 and 03 funds. If you invested in 08, obviously, you didn't fare very well. Again, you timed things poorly. This is the time to get into multifamily investment. The window is maybe 24 months tops. And maybe by 2014, 2015, um, the prices are going to be just too high. The opportunity will be lost. And then we'll probably be selling to those people and taking advantage of their poor timing. That's what Sequoia did and we did in the last cycle. We sold a tremendous number of assets in 2005 and 2006, arguably too soon in a couple of cases. But I'd rather sell too soon than too late. Here's a case study that sort of highlights what we do. It's... Uh, it was called the Ansel Apartment Building in Koreatown, in Phil, Los Angeles. Mixed-use project acquired in the fall of 2003 consisted of 82 residential units and five commercial units. The average rents we, uh, we saw when we acquired the property were roughly 98 cents per square foot, and the cap rate was a shy below 7%. As the picture shows, it was a nondescript building, nothing special, and the interiors were uh, well, I guess the professional scientific word would be blah, not very exciting whatsoever. Well, what did we do? We added value by our renovations, both the interior and exterior. On the interior, we converted, renovated, uh, I should say, about 40 units, about half of the residential units. We converted two of the commercial units to residential loft units. We were able to achieve increased rents of some 30% in 18 months. Uh, and of course, in so doing, achieved a lower cap rate. The lower cap rate, I think, reflects two things. And again, lower cap rates increases the value of real estate. One was the tailwinds cap rates were compressing at the time. But it's my knowing and firm belief that by improving the property and again, making it attractive to a wider array of buyers to whom we could sell a compelling story, we were able to get a lower cap rate and a higher price. And the pictures tell a thousand words. You can sort of see the amenities we did. Hardwood floors, better lighting, exposing the brick from what was painted a dull white previously. Increased rents were the result. This picture sort of puts that in perspective. Of the profits we generated from this asset, over 80% came from the improvements we actually made to the property. 16% less than 20% from 
the broader market trends and hanging on. We believe that's a trend that will continue. That's our strategy. And again, the nice thing about our strategy is that if the market moves against us, higher cap rates, for example, the profit we generate from renovations, from improving the units, from raising rents, and effectively managing our costs will hopefully, and that's the goal, and it's proven true, more than offset those potential headwinds. What does any potential investor looking at a private equity real estate fund have to ask, have to look at? What kind of due diligence is it absolutely crucial that you do? It is crucial you understand and believe the strategy. You have to have that broad focus and agreement with what they're trying to accomplish. And hopefully when we talk about multifamily uh, assets, you will agree with what we're doing to be a, a logical and uh, uh, profit potential thing to do. Track record historical results. How has the sponsor of the capital performed? That's crucially important. Our track record is very transparent and we certainly make that available to all investors. How do you source investment opportunities? What are your, uh, what's your network? It is crucially important that you have an effective network. It's a competitive marketplace. Having been in this business for 20 years, our network runs very deep. Access to management, management and transparency of data. It's crucial that you have both. Obviously, if you're investing in a large, with a large institution, that becomes more and more challenging. We're a middle-sized firm. Access to us is direct and transparent. What is the liquidity exit strategies? I talked about earlier, we look at a five to seven year exit time frame, sort of uh, that's our strategy, and that's when liquidity events are expected to occur. As I said, we're middle-sized. And I think the last one is crucially important. You always have to ask, how much skin does the promoter have in the game? We invest our capital side by side in every single one of our deals. And I think that's crucially important. Our money is riding alongside our investors. We put our money where our mouths are. So how can family offices best serve their clients? You can always buy a REIT and be passive. Uh, but that's certainly no, uh, no panacea. High fees uh, and sort of publicly traded companies in, in many cases. In some cases, there's private REITs and transparency is a real, real problem. Anyways, we at Sequoia Real Estate Partners in, invite your inquiries. We welcome the opportunity to, to answer any questions you might have, and we look forward to potentially partnering up with you on our future endeavors. Thank you very much.